Welcome to the McMaster course, Computing and Software 701, Logic and Discrete Mathematics. We're going to continue on the topic of recursion and induction. And today we're going to talk about primitive and general recursive functions. Now, we've already discussed the fact that recursive definitions can be faulty. They can lead to inconsistencies. For instance, if we look at this, this function here, it's defined as f of n equals f of n plus 1. So there can be no function, at least no total function, that satisfies this definition. What we'd like to do is have a scheme for defining functions by recursion in which the scheme will not lead to inconsistently defined functions as this f. So each such scheme will have a set of instance requirements and the domain of the scheme will be the set of functions that are definable by some instance of the scheme. So designers of proof assistants, these are systems for uh, proving uh, theorems in a formal logic, they prefer schemes which have easily checked instance requirements. So it's easy to tell if you have a member of your scheme and they also have a large domain of useful functions. So with your scheme, you may not be able to define all functions that you might want to define, but you can define a very large group. And we're going to look at, look at three different schemes, primitive recursive functions, general recursive functions, and monotone functional recursion. The first two we're going to look at today. So there's a class of functions called primitive recursive functions. These are functions on the natural numbers. They take any number of inputs that are natural numbers and return a natural number which is an input. All of these functions are computable. You can compute them by writing a program to do the work. Um, they are also all total. And they're defined as a set of functions that are closed under certain rules. So let's go over these rules. The first rule is the successor function. This function, the successor function, it is a member of this class of primitive recursive functions. The second rule is that all possible constant functions, no matter how many arguments they take or in what value they give. So all constant functions are a member of this class, script P. All possible projection functions. So a projection function takes a set of arguments, which are natural numbers, and it just returns one of those arguments. Another rule is composition. If we have a function f, I should say a function h, so we have this function h, and we have a bunch of functions g, and these g's all take the same set of arguments. If we compose h with g in this manner, that defines a function f. That function will be a member of p as long as the g's and h's are a member of p. And finally, we have the rule of primitive recursion. If g and h are members of p, then f will be a member of p, where f is defined as follows. So f takes n arguments, and if we have the first argument 0 and, and then the following arguments, that will be whatever g gives for those following arguments. And if we give f something that's bigger than 0 with those following arguments, it will apply, it will be this, give us back the value of h with x1 and then f with x1. And notice here, notice here, we have x plus 1, and here we have just x1, x1 plus 1, here we have x1. So this is primitive recursion. You see this looks a lot like uh, mathematical induction or weak induction. So the class P of primitive recursive functions are all the functions 
that we can define using these five rules. Okay, so let's take a simple example. Example you, you all are used to and see many times. This is an example of the factorial function. It takes one input and gives back. It takes one input that's a natural number and gives back a natural number. Okay, and we're going to define this using the primitive recursion rule. That's this rule right here, number five. And maybe I'll just leave it like this. So, so we have this function g and we have a function h. In this case, g takes no arguments, h takes two. And f of zero is going to be whatever g of no arguments gives back, which will be one. So g is basically a constant function, gives back the value one. Um, now, notice up here, when we had constant functions, we could have zero arguments. I didn't point that out. See, n, n can be zero. Okay, so here we have a constant function with no arguments. That's going to be g. f of zero is going to be g with no arguments is one. Now, f of n plus one is going to be h with n and f of n. And notice, notice that, let me erase this. Notice that here the n corresponds to the x1 and the f of n corresponds to this, but we don't have these arguments. So we, we definitely have the right form. What is h? h is h applied to xy is going to be y times x plus 1. Okay, so this is a recursive definition. I, I should say a primitive recursive uh, definition of factorial. Now, this class of primitive recursive functions is very large. Uh, but it's a proper subset of the total functions on n, so total computable functions. So there's, there's going to be total computable functions that are computable, but they're not members of P. Uh, but P, script P, contains almost all the total functions that we commonly find in mathematics. These functions we can define as primitive recursive functions using these five rules. Sometimes it may be difficult. We may have to do a lot of, of, of special representation of things, but we can define pretty much all the com most of the total functions that we commonly find in mathematics. But as I said, this uh, set is not the set of all total computable functions. There exists an f that's not in this set, and this can be constructed by diagonalization. Okay, so I now want to look at a very famous function. It's called the Ackerman function. Now there's different versions of the Ackerman function. This is not the original version. The original version took three arguments that were natural numbers and gave back one. Uh, this is a simpler version, uh, but it has it has the um, uh, same wonderful property, and that this function is not primitive recursive. It is total. You could easily pick up any programming language and and program this function. So, when the first argument is zero, we just add one to the second argument. When the second argument is zero. We subtract 1 from the first argument, and then we apply a to it. So you can see that the argument, the complexity is going down in this case. Uh, when m and n are both bigger than 0, you can see that the complexity goes down here. But we can't obviously tell what's going on here, because the complexity is getting possibly much bigger than n. 
So it's not completely obvious that this function even makes sense. Uh, but, we, but it can be shown that this function is not primitive recursive. The proof basically shows that A grows faster than every primitive recursive function. But A is a total computable function. We can prove this by ordinal induction on pairs of natural numbers, ordered pairs of natural numbers, ordered lexicographically. So this is an example of where ordinal induction is convenient. And the last thing I want to say about the Ackerman function is it grows um, just incredibly rapidly. So A43, which you might think shouldn't be that big, is basically 2 to the 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 2 minus 3. Okay, so let's sum up. We have this class of computable functions called the primitive recursive functions. All the members of this class are total. There are total computable functions that are not in this class, but this class is still very big. An example of a function that's not in this class is the Ackerman function. Okay, so now there's another class of functions, which I'm going to call script G. This class of functions is the, is the smallest set of functions that are closed under all those rules we had before for primitive recursive functions. They're right here, successor function, constant functions, projection functions, composition, primitive recursion, and an additional rule called minimalization. Now, let's try to understand what this rule says. Uh, it says if we have a G that's in our class, then, and this G can be any member, then there's an F, and this F is defined as follows. We're going to say that F applied to N arguments equals Y, where the number of arguments is going to be uh, one less than the number of arguments G. It's going to be Y if there is a, is a Y, then when I apply G to Y in the same arguments to F, I get zero. And if I apply G to some Z with the same arguments, I, I'm going to get a value that's going to be greater than zero. So in other words, this Y is going to be the smallest, the minimal value for which G will give me zero. In that case, I'm going to say F of these, these arguments here. F of these arguments. That's going to be Y. So this seems a little complicated, but this is this is um, a very powerful rule. And there's a couple things to notice about this rule. The first is that this f of x1 through xn is the smallest y that makes uh, g with these arguments equal to 0. There may not be a smallest y. There may be no y at all. In that case, we'd say f of those arguments is undefined. So because of this rule, it introduces the possibility that there are members of G which are partial. They're not defined in all inputs. And so this gives us a very large class of computable functions. And these functions are called the general recursive functions, but they're also called the mu recursive functions because this we can think of this as applying a mu operator, a minimalization operator. And they're also called the partial recursive functions because these functions include this include functions that are partial that are also recursive. Okay, so this we have this class and there's a wonderful theorem that says this class of functions is exactly the set that can be computed by a Turing machine. In other words, these are exactly this is exactly the class of functions that are computable. Functions on the natural number that are computable. And it is, you can see here, it is bigger than a set of primitive recursive functions, much bigger. 
and it contains, of course, the Ackermann function, because the Ackermann function is a computable function. It's not a P. G contains all partial and total functions on the natural numbers which are computable. Okay, so the general recursive functions are thus what we call a Turing-complete model of computation. It's a model of a computation which includes representations of all computable functions in the natural numbers. And there's other models. For instance, there's Turing machines, lambda calculus, combinatorial logic, post systems, unlimited register machines, and, and many others. All of these are equivalent. General recursive functions were really developed by Kurt Gödel in 1931 as part of his work on his incompleteness theorems and developed in much greater t detail by Stephen Kleine, particularly in his paper, 1936 paper. Okay, we're going to stop now on this topic and we'll begin next time with well-founded recursion and induction. Thank you very much. Goodbye.